Good afternoon. Can I help you? I hope so. My Portuguese friends are coming over to visit me next month and I need to find a place for them to stay that is quite central as I live in the city centre myself and want them to be close by. Can you recommend anywhere? Yes, a, a few places instantly spring to mind. What about Belvedere Gardens Hotel? Despite what the name might suggest, it's right in the city centre, on Main Street, opposite Grimes Tower. The Belvedere Gardens Hotel is located opposite Grimes Tower, so you write opposite in the space provided. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good afternoon. Can I help you? I hope so. My Portuguese friends are coming over to visit me next month and I need to find a place for them to stay that is quite central as I live in the city centre myself and want them to be close by. Can you recommend anywhere? Yes. A few places instantly spring to mind. What about Belvedere Gardens Hotel? Despite what the name might suggest, it's right in the city centre, on Main Street, opposite Grimes Tower. How much is it per night, please? Quite reasonable, given the location. Fifty dollars, and that is inclusive of a continental breakfast. Oh, that sounds nice. What about other meals? Do you have to pay extra for them? Yes. Unfortunately, lunch and dinner are not included in the price. The hotel does have a very fine restaurant, though, and I would thoroughly recommend the buffet dinner there. Customers should be seated by 7.30 in the evening, when the buffet starts. Hmm. I'll keep it in mind. Is there anywhere else you can think of? Certainly. Uh, the Belfield Grand is always a popular choice. It's located a little further out, though, on the south side of Edgware Common. Perhaps that's too far from the city centre. Not really. It's only a few stops on the subway. Depends on the price. Believe it or not, the Belfield is more expensive than Belvedere Gardens. $55. Oh, that's no good. Mind you, there is a $10 discount offered to customers who have booked online. There's also the fact that the price is inclusive of all meals breakfast, lunch and dinner, served in the guest's lounge. Before listening to the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. I like the sound of this hotel more and more. The Belfield, then, so far. Is there anywhere else? Well, you should also consider the Maple View. I don't think I'm familiar with that one. You should be. It's right in the heart of the city, next to the entrance to the pedestrian zone that runs along High Street. Sounds lovely being so close to the shops. Tell me more. It gets better. The price per night is only $28 on weekdays, though an additional $12 is charged on weekends and bank holidays. Sounds like great value for money. It is. Uh, that's why you have to book well in advance of your stay. How soon should I book then? Yesterday might not be soon enough. Yikes! I'd better get cracking. Thank you so much for your help. You're very welcome. That's the end of Section 1. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 2. Section 2. You will hear a tour leader talking to some tourists. First, you will have some time to look at questions 11 to 16.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. OK, ladies and gentlemen, may I have your attention, please? So, here we are at King's Cross Station. We'll be leaving from here in just over an hour to catch a tube from the underground station, so you'll have a bit of time to look around. But first things first, just so as you can get your bearings and find your way around this rather complex and confusing station, I will point out essential areas as well as points of interest. At the moment we are standing in King's Cross Square, facing two main exit doors, one off to our left and the other off to our right. The exits lead from the main platform area which can be accessed by several entrances, one of which is located just a bit further away to your left, although it is obscured by a wall from where we're standing. Oh, by the way, that building standing on its own, the larger, not the smaller one, on your far left is the Great Northern Hotel. The taxi rank is sandwiched between it and the left luggage office. So, before I go on to a description of the main shopping and platform areas at the other side of the station wall, I'd like to point out the most important point of all, the underground station, which is where we need to meet promptly for departure. Luckily, it's quite prominent, as it's located away from the shopping and platform area of the station. It's just over there on the corner, in between the entrance I mentioned earlier and the exit nearest to the hotel from where we're standing now. Now, for those of you who would like to grab a bite to eat or do a bit of shopping, you can enter the shopping area by that entrance door over there. It's by far the nearest entrance. You will find several clothes shops in this area in addition to a fast food outlet. When you go in the entrance, if you go straight ahead rather than turning left into the other part of the shopping complex, you will find two buildings facing one another. Within these buildings are several shops and eating places. In the building immediately after the ticket barriers on your right, you will find that the first shop you come across is the fast food outlet, Burgerland. If you need to avail yourself of the toilet facilities, then carry straight on past Burgerland and there at the far end of the building. In between the toilets and the ticket office is the disabled meeting point. You will have to enter through this area in order to gain access to the toilets. If you would like to go up to the second floor, where there are one or two shops and a pizzeria, then as you enter the shopping area through the main entrance, instead of going straight ahead, you turn off to the left. The escalators are immediately on your left again. When you go up the escalators, you will see two buildings again on your left. Go past the first building and the pizzeria is the first shop that you come to in the second building. Now, I would just like to ask, are there any Harry Potter fans with us today? Ah, good. Yes, I see several hands raised. Well, there's a treat in store for you if you go to the far end of the second building and take the escalator down again to the ground floor. As you reach the bottom of the escalator, turn right and carry on walking, keeping the ticket barrier on your left all the time. Don't turn off left, but carry on walking until you find yourself up against the station wall. This is the famous Platform 9 and 3 quarters, immortalised by J.K. Rowling in her Harry Potter books. You'll see half a trolley embedded in the wall to mark the spot. So, those are the main things to do and see. I hope you enjoy yourselves, but please meet me at the underground entrance promptly for departure. Don't be tempted to board the Hogwarts Express on Platform 9 and 3 quarters. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen 
and answer questions 17 to 20. Good. Welcome back. I'm glad you were all punctual. As you know, we have a packed itinerary which will give you a taster of London's major landmarks. Before we enter the underground, I would just like to give you some important information. Firstly, for those of you unfamiliar with the London Underground, you must retain your ticket throughout the journey, only surrendering the ticket at your final destination. This is not applicable to today's trip, but really for tomorrow when you will be at leisure and may wish to use the Underground again. For today, we have a group ticket, which means that we have to stay together at all times whilst travelling on the Underground. Should you become separated from the group and end up travelling without a ticket, you can expect to pay a hefty fine. Also, remember that while we are travelling outside the rush hour, between 5 and 7pm in the evening and from 7.30 to 9am in the morning, we will still meet with the midday crowds of shoppers. Sometimes there is only standing room at such times, so you will be lucky to get a seat at all. Priority seats do exist if you are unable to stand, although this is rarely enforced and is at the discretion of the passenger occupying such seats. Beware of pickpockets too. There are many opportunist thieves who prey on unsuspecting travellers. Obviously, keep your valuables tucked away, ensuring wallets, etc. are not visible. So, that's all for now. Let's get on with the tour. Follow me and please keep close to your group members to avoid getting separated. That's the end of section two. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to section 3. Section 3. You will hear a discussion between Steve and Melissa about their commerce course. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hey, Melissa, how's it going? Great. I'm really pleased to have the exams behind me. Now I'm looking forward to a break for the summer, as I know next year is going to be unbelievably difficult, being our final year and all. You? Same. Pleased to be finished, but dreading next year, though. Well, I wouldn't exactly say I'm dreading it, but I know what you're saying. At least we're going to have smaller classes next semester. How do you mean? Didn't you hear? The Commerce Faculty just got approval to build a new state-of-the-art lecture building over the summer months. It's expected to be finished by the start of term. Fantastic. No more lecture theatres crammed with over 200 people. That'll make a pleasant change. How on earth are they paying for it, though? I thought the college was reigning in its expenditure and decreasing spending. It is, but the grant has been approved for the best part of three years, so they have no choice but to provide it now that the project is going ahead. After all, those funds are supposed to have been set aside especially. So what's taken so long for construction to start? You see, the grant only covers 30% of the cost. The incoming government made a pledge during the election campaign that it would cover the other 70%, but... Typical of a political party, wouldn't you know? It didn't keep its promise. The College Donors Club, a group of wealthy alumni, stepped in to pledge 10% of the money needed. But the project really only got a kickstart when an anonymous donor pledged the rest. Very mysterious. Yeah, and apparently he demanded that certain changes be made to the plans before handing over the money. 
Like what? Well, you know the proposal to have a gym in the basement? Don't tell me that's been cancelled. Not at all. In fact, our anonymous donor friend insisted on it being twice the original size and on a relaxation room being added as well. You know, with games and stuff. Sweet. Are we still getting our new computer lab? There's always such an awful queue for the existing one. We are indeed, and next to it there's now going to be what they're calling the Software Zone. A place where students can access all the latest high-end software free of charge. Nice. Thank you very much, Mr Donor. Everything else is staying, right? Lecture rooms, hardware zone, etc.? Yeah, the rest the same. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. By the way, on the subject of college next year, Steve, have you decided what courses you're going to choose yet? Pretty much. I want to major in marketing, so I'm focusing on the international markets and product placement modules. Will you be joining me? Well, you know I prefer human resources. That'll probably be my major. But if you twist my arm, I'll probably join you for the first one. No way on all that product placement nonsense, though. Sounds boring. The organisational behaviour is a requirement if you want to major in HR, as is managing people, so I'll definitely do both of those. Will you join me on them, then? Sorry, Melissa. You know, HR is just not my thing. What about your optional modules? Do you feel like doing information systems with me? We all need to know a bit about the digital world, after all. Hmm, I'll get back to you. I haven't ruled out public relations, either. Let's chat about it again later in the week, when I've had some time to think. Cool. I'll call you, OK? Sounds like a plan. I'd better go now. That's the end of Section 3. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 4. Section 4. You will hear part of a talk on some well-known personality tests and their uses. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Whether for professional reasons or purely for fun, such personality assessments are abundant. They pervade our everyday lives since there is a fundamental human need to understand the motivation behind our own and others' behaviour. 
Learning how to assess personality permits greater understanding of the motivating factors affecting the way we communicate and cooperate with others, in addition to how we relate to others on a personal level. So now that we've talked about why personality tests are so important, let's take a look at the most well-known tests and see how they compare. Well, first off, we have a favourite of careers officers and potential employers alike, the graphology test. The word graphology is derived from two Greek words meaning writing and word. Essentially, it is an assessment of personality based on handwriting analysis. How an individual dots his I's or crosses his T's, in addition to whether writing is slanted or level, is believed to be indicative of the individual's personality. Whatever your opinion may be of this method of personality assessment, at least it has stood the test of time. The graphology test, as a measure of personality, was first proposed by a certain Juan Huatadi San Juan as far back as 1575, and it has seen fluctuation in its popularity since then. In the 20th century, Alfred Binet was so convinced as to its validity that he termed it the science of the future. And indeed today, it is still a very popular method of personality assessment. Its validity, though, as a measurement of character, is dubious. The British Psychological Society has even gone so far as to rank graphology alongside astrology, giving them both zero validity. A major problem with the test is that an element of subjectivity enters the assessment of certain criteria in the test, such as harmony and style of writing. However, in its favour, the test is relatively quick and easy to administer. Next, let's look at the Rorschach or Inkblot test, which is one of the better known tools of psychological assessment. Popularised in party game versions of the test, the Rorschach test has received mixed reactions amongst psychologists. Whilst many dismiss the test as a pseudoscience, it is nevertheless used by prestigious mental health organisations such as the Tavistock Clinic as a valid tool for personality assessment. Admittedly, assessing someone's character based on their reactions to a series of ink blots on pieces of card might seem somewhat ludicrous. Whilst there is a tried and tested methodology behind the construction of the test and assessment of individual responses, the test is subject to cultural bias. The perception of the card's contents is liable to be biased by cultural factors, making the individual responses somewhat meaningless. So, moving on to a test that has similar features to the Rorschach test, let's look at the Lucia Colour test. As with the former test, the Lucia Colour test assesses an individual's subjective reaction to a series of cards. However, unlike the Rorschach, the Lucia test consists of a series of coloured cards that the individual has to rank in order of preference. How the individual ranks the different colours is believed to be indicative of their personality. While some believe the test to smack of pseudoscience and many question its validity, there is, however, a biological basis to the test, which makes it more of a convincing tool of psychological assessment than many other personality tests. Certainly, its use by psychologists and doctors, as well as authorities such as government agencies and universities to screen their candidates, would seem to be a strong argument for the validity of the test. A major plus to this test is that it is so accurate that it is even sensitive to mood change. Individuals, therefore, taking the same test at different periods of time will see a correlation between results and mood. Finally, I would like to refer to the TAT test or the Thematic Apperception Test to give it its full name. On the face of it, it is a very simplistic test. As with the Rorschach and Lucia tests, the individual is dealt a series of cards. However, on these cards are depicted a series of ambiguous scenes involving groups of people. The individual is required to make up a story about each, and the individual is then assessed based on the content of each story. Whilst the test is quick and simple to administer, critics of the test argue that there is a lack of standardisation of the cards and scoring systems, making comparisons between individuals problematic. This, therefore, undermines the validity of the test. 
Nevertheless, the TAT test is still used as a tool in fields as diverse as psychological research into occupation preference and partner selection and forensic examinations to evaluate crime suspects. It is therefore a matter of individual preference as to which test is used when employed for professional reasons. All these tests, though, have their benefits and their drawbacks. No one definitive test exists that provides 100% accuracy in assessing personality. That is the end of Section 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the listening test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the listening answer sheet.